Today on Sports Card Investor, we have a very special episode for you. This past Sunday, we released a video where we featured the collection of Marshall Fogel. It's one of the biggest and best collections of sports cards and memorabilia in existence. And we were very happy to bring you that video this past Sunday. When we went to go film that video, Marshall said that he wanted to share a lot of his insights around how he was able to build such a large collection. And he wanted to share thoughts and tips that may inspire the next generation of collectors and might inspire you to build that type of collection yourself over time. So I sat with him for a long period of time. We talked for hours. And today we're showing most of that interview. We're releasing a full length cut of my conversation with Marshall Fogel. It's a long interview, but trust me, it's worth it. There's so many nuggets and insights you're gonna get from this. So sit back, relax, grab a cup of coffee or a beer, or listen to this on the podcast version and enjoy this interview with Marshall Fogel. Marshall, this is an honor. Thank you for having me here today. And, and I'm looking forward to learning from you about how you have built the greatest collection of sports cards and memorabilia, I think, to ever exist. Do you think it's the greatest collection? Well, before I say that, I want to thank you for coming. And uh, we had a chance to meet and greet before we had this interview. And I certainly enjoy the experiences that you had in your life and the successes that you have. And I had an opportunity to meet the the crew, yeah, and uh, we're going to have one hell of a good time. Good, um, and in my opinion, um, I think I have a world class collection. Sure, uh, I don't think there's anybody that collects that doesn't think they have the best collection. But I happen to think I'm I'm, per I'm probably up there. Yeah, a hundred percent, absolutely. Well, thank and you for the compliment. Yeah, and the range of the collection is absolutely incredible. And I know we're going to see a variety of different types of pieces today from your collection, but you've got everything from, you know, type one photographs to gloves to bats to, of course, unbelievable array of cards, including that iconic, the best Mickey Mantle 1952 Topps card in existence. I'm proud of what I have and I like sharing it with the community. I've done a lot of things with museums and the community to enjoy it. And I, I'm going to enjoy this interview because I think what we're trying to do today in talking to you off the camera is let's educate the people that enjoy this, not only collectible asset business, but as a hobby, just to have a yeah. good time with it and enjoy collecting uh, their memories of the people they watch play ball and the people that they are icons in the, in the sports world that are no longer with us. So... Uh, Let's get the game on and have a hell of a good time. I like it. Well, before we start seeing some of the pieces, I'd love to hear the story again about how you got into this to begin with. Because you, you, you kind of encountered this without really knowing a lot about sports memorabilia uh, back in 1990. Is that correct? 1989. 1989. I went to Chicago uh, on a vacation with my family. And uh, I understood there was a sports national convention. I think it was like at a Holiday Inn in the basement. And as a kid, you know, I always liked Mickey Mantle when I had his bat. And I think like a lot of us, um, it helps us share our memories by, by collecting. And I went downstairs and I looked at all this stuff. And at that time, I didn't know that Ty Cobb was a ball player. I thought he might be a dress designer. You know, I was learning the <laughs> business. And, you know, as a kid, I was... A, second string on any athletic event. So, uh, but I love the sports industry and love playing baseball. And I used to wrestle in school. So I, I was sort of a sports addict in a way. And when I went downstairs and from the escalator, I had heard about Al Rosen and Bill Master. Mm -hmm. And I was intimidated. I have to tell you, the first card I ever bought was a 1953 Mickey Mantle card, and it turned out it was trimmed. So mm -hmm. I didn't get off to a great start, but I didn't give up as well. So it, it's kind of interesting because people now know who Al Rosen is because of the Mantle card being sold and Bill Mastro, who really brought this from a hobby to, to uh, 
not only a hobby, but a collectible asset. And how that happened was, I remember walking down the stairs and there was Bill Mastro, you know, and he was kind of a verbose type of guy, and Al Rosen, you know, she's a shouter. So I was going to go up and introduce myself to Bill Mastro, and I see that a little 12-year-old kid had put his fingerprints on the case, and Bill said, get your hands off the case. I don't want anything to do. You don't have any money. Get out of here. So I, I had nothing to do with those guys. You know, I was scared to death because I didn't know what I was doing. But I knew enough that I loved what I saw. And that launched me starting to collect before I had met David Hall and became the poster boy for PSA around 1995. Mm -hmm. So what did you buy at that first national? I bought the Mantle card mm -hmm. and I bought some Bowmans, 51, 52 Bowmans. And, uh, and I didn't buy any memorabilia at that time because I didn't understand it. And so I probably spent, you know, back then, maybe $20,000, $25,000. In that, those days, it was above average expenditure. Sure. And I was buying cards for $15, $25, $50. You could buy a Colfax rookie for, uh, if I remember, $125, a Babe Ruth about $1,200. So that gives you an example yeah, things of have the changed. genesis of the be being at the beginning. It's sort of like I felt like I was Moses coming down from Mount Sinai, uh, you know, and starting a whole new religion, and that's collecting for well, me. You know, and what's interesting is, so 1989, that was the peak of the junk wax era. So that was when most people that year, I'm sure, went to the National, I would imagine most people were focused on the new FLIR baseball or the new, you know, upper deck baseball came out for the first time in 1989. I imagine that was, you know, a lot of the attention and focus, but you shied away from the new stuff. You turned around and paid attention to all of this older stuff, which I imagine, you know, there were a lot of people there focused just on the newer stuff. I think the answer to your uh, question is, did I even know about Upper Deck and mm -hmm. some of the new 1989 Bowmans and so on? I didn't see much of that there because I think they were at, uh, starting to market the product and so it wasn't a highlight at the okay. National at that time. Now, in 91 in Anaheim, we'll talk about that. Yeah, 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 cause, because it, yeah, and at 91 in Anaheim, that was the, what is still considered to be the most attended National in history. Uh, some people thought that the last couple, you know, might have a chance of breaking the record, but they, they fell slightly short. 91 Anaheim, still the all-time attendance record. Uh, I hear that that, was, that one was just kind of mass hysteria, and I guess maybe marked the point when sports cards had hit their absolute kind of craziest peak moment. Let's put it this way. I thought it was the best sporting event I've ever been w with other people, and then they had special cards for the event. Well, that was the first time we ever saw, as we now know today, these limited edition cards. Mm -hmm. I don't remember who the players were, but I know guys were getting them for free and then going outside and selling them for three, four hundred dollars for the packs or whatever they were contained in cellos or whatever. But uh, what that meant to me was uh, I'm onto something. This is pretty exciting. Yeah. And I'm not the only skin in the game. Yeah. I'd say there's some similarities probably between what that experience was like in 1991 at Anaheim and what we maybe have seen at the last couple of nationals where there's a lot of, you know, a lot of hysteria now, especially there especially was last year around, you know, modern cards, brand new releases, um, you know, people, people, people say that the, the price of new boxes today is crazy and everything like that. But many people coming into the sports card industry many people coming to the hobby for the first time are they orient towards the new you know they orient towards the ultra modern and then they then they maybe discover some of the vintage over time and that was my experience as well when i got back into it in 2018 was i oriented towards the brand new shiny stuff and then as i continued through i i started to pay attention to the older stuff and started to scoop a lot of it up as well you though 
went straight for the older stuff and and I, I you don't have I don't think you have an affinity for kind of the new stuff that's coming out today well I have a some of a, a detailed interesting response to your uh, narrative and that is that um, what is it in starting our conversation and our visit what is it about baseball that's so attractive. What is it about the golden era of baseball that remains in perpetuity? And I think the answer is as follows. You have basketball, hockey, football, baseball, tennis, golf, and so on. The real sport of the singular hero is baseball. To score a basket in basketball, you need a whole team to pass and score the points. Football, you need 11 players on offense to do their job to score a touchdown. But to hit a home run and call the shot in 1932, or to play in 56 consecutive games where you get a hit, or you hit 714 home runs in your career, or 60 home runs in a season, nobody forgets that. People why is Joe Jackson's signature the most expensive signature in American sports? So questions have answers. One of the answers is, what is it about baseball beyond the singular hero? How many times can you be so good that when a pitcher is 60 feet, 6 inches away from the plate, and after the stretch, he's 56 feet away and throws the ball in 0.02 seconds, and a guy's holding a stick? The best way I can define the sport of baseball and why it still remains the king in collecting and always will, especially the vintage stuff, the you know, cards, is because if you watch The Field of Dreams mm -hmm. with Kevin Costner. Yep. One of my, I, my favorite movie of all time, by the way. It's mine as well. Yeah. Or The Natural with Robert yep. Redford. Yep. I'm going to ask you, Jeff, what happened the last 20 seconds of each of those movies? You tell me. And if you don't know the answer, don't be embarrassed. No, no. Well, that, I mean, in the Field of Dreams, uh, there was the catch. There was the father-son connection. There was the father-son moment. Same with the natural. Mm -hmm. In the Field of Dreams, he never had a chance to play catch with his right. dad. In the natural, he didn't know he had a son. Mm -hmm. So if you go to that movie, if you ever d did, I've never seen so many men have a tear in their yeah, eye. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it chokes people up. Yeah, I went to Field of Dreams with my dad. I remember watching it when, you know, with my, we went to the theaters when it was out in the theaters and I went with my dad and I remember it being a very special moment. I actually visited the field out in Iowa uh, for that reason, you know, did, did a pilgrimage to go see it. My father and mother, you know, my father was a, from Eastern Europe and he didn't know about baseball. And I used to beg him to play catch. So one day he decided to play catch. He throws the ball to me, and I th I'm 11 years old, and I threw the ball back to him, and I broke his thumb. <laughs> so I do remember that <laughs> moment, but I also remember, his, and I'm even as old as I am, I still see it in my mind, my father and I playing catch. Mm. So people say, what is it about baseball? It's the movies, it's your father playing yeah. catch. It's that simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. Mm -hmm. Do you have any concern that with the demographics of the country shifting, with, it, with the attention span of the you know, young generations becoming shorter, uh, you see the, the numbers in terms of what sports people are watching and you see uh, you know, over the last 20 years, you've seen football rise. You've seen recently soccer have an incredible surge in, you know, surge in popularity in the country. Um, you know, basketballs remain popular, but you've seen, you've seen baseball fall. Uh, as, you know, you've seen ratings for baseball fall. There's not as many fans today. They're having a more difficult time getting the younger generation into the game. And I'm curious, as a collector of so much of baseball history, do you think that in the long term could have an impact over, uh, you know, over what people are, are you know, collecting or wanting to collect and, and pay attention to? I think there's some complexity to your question. Um, 
And I think what you're asking me is, is the game of baseball such that because the attendance is not as rampant as other sports, uh, it's a slower game, um, it's, uh, is it going to affect the vintage card market? Maybe is more in line with what you're trying to find out from me. Um, I'm not concerned about it at all. I think what's happening, sports in general, is becoming an international sport. Whether it's baseball, football in London, uh, soccer's becoming much more attentive in here. Uh, hockey, of course, Colorado Avalanche won the hockey uh, Stanley Cup. Uh, all that's great. But nobody remembers Lenny Dawson, Daryl LaMonica, Jim Otto, uh, they don't, Bob Cousy, yeah. Havlicek, Bob Pettit, but they remember Ruth, Cobb, Wagner, Garrett, DiMaggio, Colfax, Greenberg, uh, the Cobb, as sure. I said. Mays, Mantle. I mean, the list goes yeah, on. Hank Aaron. Why is that? Why do we remember people that have been gone for over 50 to 100 years? In, in many cases, I mean, I never saw any of those guys play. But, of course, I know their names. They're legendary. And I know stories. You know, the stories are legendary, right? I think it's because... First of all, baseball has statistics that no other sport has. It's true. There's a whole generation of people that love just the statistics of the sport. Uh, I just don't think that we're going to see the popularity of any sport really go down uh, because it's the special golden part of baseball. The way I see it now is I remember watching movies where Joe DiMaggio said, Thank God I'm a Yankee. Or Mickey Mantle, when, you, when I spoke to him, when we had uh, drinks together in Atlantic City, he said, if I would have been traded, because they were thinking of trading um, him at one time, probably not thinking too long about it, he would have quit. And I, I just feel that the singular hero will survive. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing about it is um, you don't have the same type of player today. These guys played in the golden era for the love of the sport. Mm -hmm. Now I think whether it's football, soccer, hockey, it's all about money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have had Larry Walker uh, spent time with him, and he never wanted to leave Denver because he wanted to stay the same team like Todd Helton, and uh, a lot of, you know, I think a lot of people that play for mid-market teams, they become a hero because they're so good. Yeah. And the minute they go after the money, they get forgotten. And baseball is woven into American history much more than any other sport. And the reason why is, if you, re if you look back in history, uh, we're a land of immigrants. So... Uh, the Polish lived in their neighborhood, the Jews lived in their neighborhood, the Irish, the Italians, the Catholics, the Protestants, and we lived in our safe communities. Then they played baseball. So everybody from every nationality, race, creed, color, national origin would go and root for the team. And from there, they got to know each other. And business relationships got started. And people started to evolve, evolve into the neighborhoods that were integrated in the culture. So baseball has played a, a big part in our culture in, in, in integrating uh, the great American dream uh, where, you know, over time we've learned uh, that all men are created equal. And I think baseball had a lot to do with it. And I think that's why they call it the national game. And when was the first time the national election was ever played at a sporting event? Baseball. Interesting. I didn't know that. So your collection is predominantly baseball, but you do actually have some other sports represented as well. Yes, I have some hockey. I have Bobby Orr's hockey stick where he won uh, Defenseman of the Year in 1972, Mario Lemieux, Gordy Howe, and so on. I, uh, my dad and I love boxing. We used to watch Gillette Sports boxing 
Ezra Charles, Jersey Joe Walcott, uh, Rocky Marciano, uh, uh, you know, the list goes on. And when I was a kid, as you can see by looking at me, I'm not very heavy and I'm not very tall. So my dad hired a professional boxer and taught me how to take care of myself. So that, with my hands and carrying a baseball bat in my bicycle, I was able to handle the barrio. <laughs> so I do like, I love boxing, I love hockey, but my real true enjoyment is uh, the history of baseball yeah. and the, uh, the fact that I can hold in my hand the cards, photos, bats, and so on that were held by my heroes. You, since you started collecting back in 1989, correct. you've amassed an absolutely incredible collection. And I had the honor of getting to see a lot of it today, and we're going to show the audience some of it now. And you, uh, of all different types of, of collectibles, mainly baseball, but within that, all different types, how, uh, and, I, and I'm sure you've learned so much along the way and i can't wait to hear some of those stories because i know they're going to translate to what our our audience wants to hear um how much do you think your collection is worth today well that's a self-serving answer but i i don't think it's a question of value of money i think it's a question of value of the quality and of of what i collect uh my view is that uh it's only by circumstance that it become valuable. I, I collected because I loved it, uh, but I didn't control what is happening today in the marketplace by the popularity of, of collecting. I think it's wise to know how that happened. Why did it, a hobby turn into a collectible asset and remain a hobby? So if you have $500 or $50, you're just as important as a guy spending $2 million. And in my view, uh, if this was only like in the world of art, if all the, they had Monet, Monet, Utrillo, Rembrandt, Rubens, uh, that market is for the whales, the, the, the guys with a lot of money and, and gals with a lot of money. What makes this a hobby and a collectible asset industry is because of the interest in the game, the singular hero, the sport, the people love when, you know, uh, when their team wins. Winning is a big deal in American life. And uh, so uh, the way I look at it is uh, what keeps this alive is not the most expensive collections, but the fact that there's so much for everybody to have skin in the game. So, uh, yes, I have a monetarily valuable collection, but, and I'm overwhelmed by the values, what the stuff is selling for, but my motivation has always been the emotional attachment to the sport, the enjoyment of collecting, the people I meet like Jeff Wilson and the crew that's here today, uh, and sharing it with the community. I think today, what, in light of what your narrative has been with me, is to have fun explaining and educating uh, the people that enjoy uh, uh, collecting sports. Yeah, which just really gives the opportunity to do. I yeah. welcome that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. Uh, I love your thought as well. It's an interesting comparison that you just made to the art world, because. You're right that if you're going to collect the, the greats in the art world, that is very much a rich man or rich woman's game. And there's not as much ability to collect art if you only have $100 or $500 that you're going to put into it. But cards and memorabilia offers you the ability to play the rich man's game and, and buy exceptional pieces that could be worth millions of dollars or you can go to the local card show and you can take $100 with you and you can pick up some really nice, interesting cards that connect you with the players you love and the teams you love and build a collection, even if the collection is on the, you know, on the very low end financially. Well, my, my, uh, I come from a, a 
sort of middle class family. My father's from Eastern Europe. My mother's first generation American from uh, uh, Romania. And, uh, you know, uh, my dad had a pawn shop and uh, I had a very close family. Uh, I uh, played, you know, baseball and wrestled and, you know, did what kids do. and. And, uh, you know, I lived in the 50s. Life was simple. The rules were clear. You, you got on a bus and a nun got on the bus, you stood up. If a woman was with you, you opened the door for her. So, you know, it was, it was simple and wonderful. We watched programs, All in the Family, Leave it to Beaver, Father Knows Best, Gunsmoke. Uh, you know, uh, it was just a lot of fun. And uh, so I, I went to uh, uh, school. Uh, I was a not a good student at all, and uh, uh, I barely got out of college. I barely got out of law school, but I just to be short, I gave a lecture. We had to give a lecture in, in labor law and law school. I went to Denver University with a lot of older men, because there weren't a lot of women in the law then, that uh, were on the GI Bill. So after I never, I have a pretty, fairly good photographic memory, and I never use notes. I can try a case on a post-it. So I gave this lecture with no notes, and the dean of the law school taught the class, and he said, Mr. Fogel, everybody leave but you. And they all thought I was going to get kicked out of school because my grade average was below freezing. So um, he said, and this will be summarized everything, he said, you are the worst student in the school, you know that? I said, yes, sir. And uh, you're one of the youngest in the school, I know that, but you're a lousy student. Yes, sir. I sa he said, you'll never be a judge. You'll never be a corporate lawyer. But you got a mouth on you. You'll be one hell of a trial lawyer. Go find your way. And I'll never forget it. And so because of some political influence that my family had, I got, um, I was 24 years old, I got in the DA's office in Denver, and I'm still the youngest they ever hired. By the time I was 27, I handled over 30 murder cases, tried the mafia, I've seen it all. I uh, started my own firm, Vogel, Keating, and Wagner, and, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm a little guy, but in a courtroom, watch out. And, uh, but now I'm a nice guy. Uh, because I, I'm with you, Jeff Wilson, and I like talking about my humility, which I learned recently. I've always been a person who has always wanted everything neat and tidy and simple. And, and, and even when I had toys, I always took care of them in comic books, you know. For some reason, I had the instinct to want to uh, uh, have everything in order. Uh, and I think that's important, is to have structure in, in collecting. And, and to be a person of great detail and, and to uh, uh, be orderly and think a lot about what you're doing. So the background of my collecting is A, educate yourself. B, rely on yourself. Read about it. Learn about it. Enjoy it. Don't depend on the auction houses for, for anything. Get a mentor that's a collector. Collect horizontally, don't collect vertically. And what I mean by that is if you collect Brooklyn Dodgers, there's a point where if you keep drilling down, you're gonna get a bunch of stuff nobody cares about. You wanna collect the, you wanna figure out who do I wanna collect to? I wanna collect Colfax, Greenberg, Matheson, uh, you know, whatever. Wh what subjects do you wanna collect? I decided to collect horizontally. I wanted to collect the history. Uh, and I also wanted to collect the condition is everything. I don't really care if Babe Ruth signed a photo of him with a called shot and it looks like a fifth wheeler truck ran over it. I'm not buying that. Now, that doesn't mean somebody else couldn't buy it because they can afford it. But I think condition is everything. Also, look, look at what, what are you buying? What's the story behind what you're buying? And so that's generally the way I look at it. Uh, I think the main thing I can tell the viewers of this, uh, of what we're doing here today, you don't, you're the sheriff. You're, you're responsible for your mistakes and you're responsible for the assets that you accumulate. Learn what you're doing. Learn, and we're gonna talk about LOAs and all that later on, 
But um, I've had people that have money that want my advice and I give it to them and then they go off on their own and they don't call back and they make a lot of mistakes and they spend a lot of money and they then they lose money on it. Uh, and I, so I think you, you have to understand there is, in every time there's money, there's fraud. And that doesn't mean that it's rampant, but it's there. And so that's why education is important. And when we get talking about uniforms and bats and everything, we'll get into that uh, in the weeds a little more. And tell me, tell me about the scope of your collection today. I collect, first of all, I collect baseball bats because it's the weapon. You go to, you go to the New York Metropolitan Museum and you see armor, bows and arrows and spears. Well, what, what, what is a bat? The bat's what makes the player. The bats, the weapon, mm -hmm. okay? That's how I see it. So I got into bats right away. Photographs. When I look at a photograph, I see an image, but I want to know the story behind it. So I collect photographs, advertising pieces. When you see Stan Musial smoking a Chesterfield cigarette and Gil Hodges saying, it's, uh, these cigarettes are mild, you know, it's part of history. Uh, I like the color of the advertising pieces. I like, you know, to get one that's not re overly, not restored. And, and, and you know, and also uh, the beauty of the color of it. Uh, I collect uh, uh, pinbacks, celluloid, metal pins, uh, everything. Let's see, I collect baseball gloves, uh, magazines that don't have labels on them. Uh, I collect... Uh, uh, baseball gloves, baseball, signed baseballs, autograph photos. Um, I collect, uh, uh, like I have Joe DiMaggio's handprints in, in, in uh, clay. You know, it's kind of fun when people put their hands in it. Um, I collect optics. I like to have people see, God, that's beautiful. It's not so much the image, you know, I don't care to collect a card that looks like a truck ran over signed by Babe Ruth because it's, the optics aren't there. There is something beautiful about something beautiful. One of the things you collect is cards. Yes. And uh, outsiders have said that you have the most important baseball card in the world and of those cards, the best conditioned version of that card, the most valuable version of that card. The 1952 Tops Mickey Mantle, you have one of three PSA 10 cards and yours earned the Black Diamond sticker from Mike Baker who actually graded all of those and he attested that yours is the nicest copy ever to exist. Well, we decided, he, he thought, well should we call it the Mona Lisa or the Holy Grail? The Mona Lisa doesn't have a religious connotation, so we thought the Holy Grail, you know, had sort of the, the Templar look to it, you know. I mean, it, it, uh, it, it, it has a magical name. Um, do you want to know how I got the card? I would love to hear the story. <laughs> okay. It did not come from the Rosenfind. The Rosenfind, uh, uh, most of those cards have sort of a brown coloring on the top, mm -hmm. and the centering isn't there. This card, believe it or not, came out of a pack. And a guy that owned it was an architect named Murphy. And I've forgotten his first name, but his son is a dealer. And Murphy was, a, I haven't talked to him in years, but he was a, he's a wonderful man and a very respectful guy, good, great architect. And so uh, what happened was um, Murphy had the 52 top set. This is before grading. And he decided to sell it in Wolfer's auction in San Francisco. Dwayne Garrett ran that auction. It used to be a coin auction and then he got it into cars as well. And so the minute, the, the, if you could pay 250,000, you'd have the set. And it was a monster. I mean, the, you know, back then you could find beautiful cars. Not as easy today. Didn't sell. The set didn't sell. Mm. So David Hall ended up buying some of those cards and he paid 50 grand 
for the mantel car. Well, in 1996, there was a whole contest who was going to sell his collection because David had to sell his collection because you can't collect and grade at the same time. And that's another story today as well. But So he sold his collection and the mantel card was there. And uh, Superior Auctions got the, the deal to sell David Hall's collection. I had to have that card. Knowing, I didn't know if there was 20 other 10s out there or whatever it is. I just had to have... The, that 10 and uh, so luckily it turned out to be the holy grail that was sheer luck so I'm at the auction at my home there's a grocer from New York never bought a card in his life but had seen the mantle card on display never I still stay in touch with him it was him and me 40,000 50,000 60,000 and then I think some people dropped out now it's me and the grocer from New York, and I'm on the phone. There's no internet. David Hall's on the phone, calls me, 75,000, make it 80. And he got the other guy on the other phone, it's going like this. He said 80, 85, 90, 100. Well, now we're, I, it's 121,000 and I'm done. So I say 121,000 and David Hall, 121,000. And it's silence. I said, David, hammer the thing. You know, of course, he's not going to hammer it. It's, you know, it's about money. Hammer it. The guy never hears another word. And bang, he hammers it. I get it for 121000 and that. And so David, I, I didn't have cash of 121000 in 1996. David said, you'll get credit. Because he already, I'm already his poster boy by then, you know. And, and it looked good that Marshall Fogel bought the card. And so... Um, that's how I got the card, and I got highly criticized in SCD for buying the card. They thought I was a fool, and I told you now I'm wise. No one had ever paid anywhere close to that no. for, for a post-war no. baseball card at the time. I, let me put it this way. I was considered the dumbest human being on the face of the earth. No question about it. And as the hobby grew and collectible assets grew and all the others came out, and you know mine got the black label, um, I'm really... So lucky, not only to own that card, but some other really crazy stuff that's pretty cool. You paid $121,000 for the card. Today, people say maybe it's worth $35 million, maybe it's worth more than $35 million. Do you have a feeling what the value is? Well, it's what anybody will pay for it, but I can tell you this, uh, um, until you see the money, I, I, I do think it's it's up there. Uh, this is my speculation. Uh, I think the interest level in owning that card because of so many oligarchs now buying this stuff, uh, I don't have any question that it's the most valued card in the world. And the son of a pawnbroker owns it, who used to work construction and had the lowest grade average in law school. You don't have to be smart to be eccentric and you don't have to be smart to, to have instinct. You just have, you know what it is, Jeff? Success in life and collecting and anything you do is knowing the street. Getting along with people, having humility. God takes care of those that take care of others. And if you live your life that way, you'll be successful in anything you do and work your butt off. Would you sell the mantle card for any offer today? Well, the answer to that is I about 20 acres in a cemetery and I'm building a pyramid and I'm going to lay the mantle card on my chest when they bury me and you can all wish you could figure out how to dig my body up. No, I, I, uh, I don't have an answer for that. I don't care about the money right now. Uh, I enjoy sharing what I have. Um, you know, would I ever sell it? Uh, I'd consider offers, but I'm right now in my stage in life. Uh, you know, it's it's nothing I'm really thinking hard about because uh, it's not a matter of money with me. It's a matter of owning something that everybody wants to see. I have an ability to share what I have, and if I sell the card, I don't want it not to. I don't know if, if people will have a chance to enjoy it. You know, I displayed it at the All Star Game in yeah. Denver, so. I like I like 
people enjoying what I have. A lot of collectors, they, they want to keep it a secret. What, what, what for? You can't keep a secret today anyway. Yeah. Tell me about displaying it at the All-Star Game because that was quite the spectacle. Well, part of my business is I'm, I, I'm a certified law enforcement instructor and uh, I do a lot with law enforcement. I started the Denver Police Brotherhood. I'm on the Denver Police Officers Foundation. I really care about the, those people. Uh, I've represented them in problems that they've had, family, all kinds of things. That's part of my practice. So uh, we were able to get motorcycle cavalcade of mm -hmm. cops uh, to take the card from the safety deposit box in a caravan to the stadium with all the press there and the sirens going off in an armored car. Uh, and it, the car deserved it. And uh, it, it is, and you see the card in person uh, and people love to see it. I, I can tell you, you can look at all the Mantle 52s you want and you look at that card, it's almost like you're looking at a secret. How could it be so beautiful? The color the condition, the corners, then it came from a pack. It didn't end up in a kid's bicycle spokes. It wasn't thrown against the wall. It wasn't thrown away by his mother, and it survived. Part of the value of it is it's so old and never got hurt. Yeah. It's really very special. Yeah. And so is Mickey Mantle. I love the guy. I loved his career. I loved his story. I loved his image. Look at the, all the other 52 cards in that set and look at the mantle card, like the 53. Why is it so special? It looks so different than all the other cards and the 407 cards in that set. Because sometimes, uh, sometimes the spirit of heaven shines its hands on special people and special things. And I think something, you know, the print, the color was right. They put the right ink in. All the things had to happen for that card to make it what it is. So sometimes if you're spiritual, some maybe there's another hand that played a game to make that card what it is, to put their hand on it. It's just so amazing. Hmm. That's wonderful. Wonderful. I'm sure you're unbelievably proud to own that. I'm proud to own it, and I'm proud to share it. Yeah. Well, let's share some of your other pieces, because I'd love to see them. Where do you want to start? Cards. Okay. So I thought we'd create a little magic moment, and I'll open box number let's one. Let's do it. I so. see it's labeled Cracker Jacks. So oh, wow. Wow, right? Is, the, yes, this is, you wow. You describe them. Yeah, so the, the Cracker Jack set is, is one of the hardest sets to find in really good condition. And I'm looking at a Hannes Wagner 1915 Cracker Jack Mint 9, an unbelievably good looking card. Now, of course, the most iconic card from this Cracker Jack set is actually the Chulis Joe Jackson. And there, there it is. And the Ty Cobb, unbelievable. This Chulis Joe Jackson in an 8 the Ty Cobb in an eight, these cards look unbelievably crisp. Absolutely amazing. Jeez. The red the red pops, these cards look like they were printed yesterday. They look so fresh. Claire, but you can get an idea of, they're all pretty consistent. Wow. Yeah, they're all beautiful. So they're all, Here's a, are, they, are they all PSA eights or better? I have no sevens in my collection in cards. They're all eight, nines, and tens. Your entire collection. Yes, I don't collect sevens, sixes, or anything else. So everything in your collection, and, and you range from pre-war through, uh, you know, the Gaudi, all the all the different Gaudi sets, and 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 on through uh, tons of top sets in the fifties and sixties. And yes, it's all eight or above. PSA eight yes. or above. Incredible. Sevens are not allowed in in, okay. in my collection, except the exhibit cards or some of the other, you know, other items. But right. Uh, you know, that's what a beautiful Christy Mathewson as well. Look at that card. Beautiful. So what's the next one? Mickey. So this entire box is Mickey Mantle cards. They're all nines and tens. So this is my favorite. The 1957. What makes, what makes this one your favorite? I just like the way the optics are in it. I like yeah. the dark background. I like the pop that you can mantle is so dimensional in the card. Yeah. And uh, uh, he's younger then. 
I uh, think he's, you know, 56 is his, uh, uh, his uh, triple crown year. And of course, that is one of my favorite cards. But my other favorite card is your favorite card, I think, in, yeah. when we talked earlier. And you, why don't this. you explain this to the audience, what so, you see here? I'll let you do the explaining. So this is the 1956 Topps Mickey Mantle card. So first of all, this was the year that he won the Triple Crown, yes. um, which, you know, and this was still very early in his career. Um, so this was, you know, kind of a coming out, you know, year for Mickey Mantle with just how incredible of a ball player he was. But I also love this card because the 1956 Topps design is such an iconic design. And, and many people consider this, uh, design from this year, one of one of the best looking, if not the best looking baseball card sets of all time. Um, beautiful image of Mickey Mantle, both uh, his portrait where he's smiling uh, and, and it, just a really nice portrait shot of him. He looks happy as well as, of course, the shot where he's, you know, leaping into the outfield and making a catch in the background. It's got the, auto, you know, the autograph, um, obviously, it's part of the card design, not hand autographed, but um, all of that makes it incredible. And then this copy in particular, being a PSA 10, it's it's almost impossible to find these in PSA 10. Absolutely beautiful copy of this card. Why don't we do one did, more? Did I do a good job describing it? <laughs> I'm going to hire you, but you cost a lot of money, so I may have to just have you here for an hour. Uh, I want to show you some these kind of cards. And the reason I am, you know, they're checklist cards. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to have a lot of money to have a mantle card. Okay. So why don't you explain why you could have, these are affordable even in eight or a seven or sure. something. Sure. Well, I mean, so, you know, card sets for many, many years used to include checklist cards and because the sets were really built for collectors to build a complete set. And the manufacturer wanted the, wanted people to, to go out and build a complete set. So they included these checklist cards so that you could literally check off all the cards that you had and eventually complete the entire set by checking off all the all the boxes on the checklist cards. And in these cases, they included an image of Mickey Mantle on the checklist cards. So, you know, while most collectors are going after the actual true Mickey Mantle card from these sets, this is this is a way to still get a card that features Mickey Mantle's image and in some cases is going to feature his name along, you know, as, as one or multiple of the cards in the checklist as well. Um, and uh, these cards are, you know, oftentimes kind of disregarded or forgotten about by a lot of collectors. They, they can be hard to get in high grade because, of course, many people check the boxes. You know, many people use the checklist for their intended purpose. So to get them clean, crisp, beautiful looking like these two copies are, uh, those are actually quite rare. So I also want to show some other affordable kinds of cards. So you have these uh, leader cards yep. that have mantle on them and, yep. and Hall of Famers. So I'm trying to appeal to those that, you know, you can get a nice six for, mm -hmm. I don't know, a couple hundred bucks. But, you, you know, you don't have to be a big well in the ocean to collect uh, your favorite player. Uh, same with team cards. Right. It's another way to do it. Yeah. Yep. So... Uh, I do want to show you one of the hardest cards to get in good grade. I'm going to see if you can guess what it is. Okay. In a mantle card. What year would it be? Hardest card to get in a good grade. Um, what year? Well, I would I would have assumed that the earlier stuff would be, you know, difficult. The 51, 52, 55. See the corners? 55. That's a 10, by the way. Wow. And what makes this so difficult Look to at get the into a good grade? Look at the grain, the wood grain. I see. What is it about Mickey Mantle for you? Why Mantle? The story. The story of his life. And the fact that a 19-year-old kid is replacing Babe Ruth and Joe DiMaggio in center field. And the pressure on a kid from Commerce City, Oklahoma. And uh, Stengel loved him. And when he got sent down... Because uh, George Weiss wanted him sent down. Stengel hated that. Everybody knew. Think he played for Joplin, Missouri. How do you know a kid that young would be so great? I don't think there's a ball player in the modern era that can match Mantle. And when Gene Levy wrote her book on Mantle, uh, and we'll talk about that when we get into photographs, uh, she she has statisticians compare Mays and Mantle. Mantle's far 
exceeds Mays' abilities, and though Mays is one of the greatest ball players in the modern era, how do you be a switch hitter and be so powerful? How do you be have such so many injuries and be so great? How do you how do you do it? I mean, I, I just think he's one of the greatest athletes that ever lived. You got to meet Mickey Mantle before, yes. as you said. I met him in Atlantic City, uh, and you know it's interesting. There's two players in my lifetime that I met that have the aura of Elvis Presley and Clint Eastwood, and that's Sandy Colfax and Mickey Mantle. Mm. When you meet, if you ever have a chance or had a chance to meet Mantle or meet, meet Colfax today, and you walk up to that table, if you know, the last time I saw Colfax, the line in Chicago went around the block. Mm. It's the most popular autograph ever. He's one of the most handsome, good looking guys. And uh, Bearer, once when I met Bearer, he said, he said, Somebody told me they hit a home run off of Colfax, and I called him a liar. Pre-war. Now, I'm going to let you, <laughs> not me, pick out some of what you like. These and are... You're, you're, you're the star performer right now. No, these, this is... I'm humbled by this collection. I'm not the star performer here. It's, this, is, this collection is the star performer, and you for owning it. This is absolutely incredible. So these are all pre-war... These are the tobacco cards. These are the T206s and the T205s. And you're saying these are all PSA 8 or greater as well? Yes. Unbelievable. So you, Look at that. you have fun and yeah, that Chrissy to the camera Matthewson. and explain it. Oh, wow. Yeah, this, I mean, that's funny. That's the, that's the card people say look like, looks like Nat Turner. It does look like Nat Let Turner. Let me see which one. Look, Chrissy Matthewson. That looks... Matthewson's not overweight in this photo. You can tell me that I said that. <laughs> I'm good friends with him. He's a good guy. And, and Matheson didn't collect unopened boxes. Ty Cobb, Sporting Life Ty Cobb card. Incredible. Wow. This is, I mean, wow. This is just a who's who of just early baseball. There's the famous, that's the famous Ty Cobb Redback. Unbelievable. I'll help you out a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. Pulling the best, pulling the greatest hits out of there. Oh wow, we're gonna get us some Gaudi. Oh gosh, this is <laughs> maybe it makes better impression. Now this one's it. not pre-war. This one snuck in here. This one's got to go back to your fifties oh, cards. It, 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 you it's, never see an eight point five of Wilson Wiener. No, this happens to be my favorite Wilson. That's card. incredible. Yeah. That's absolutely incredible. So I'll just lay these out and you can wow. photograph. I think it looks better if we do it this way. What do you think? I, I think this is the most ridiculous table of sports cards being laid out like this that I have ever seen in my life. I, this is, we're splashing the pot right now with just, un, I don't even know what to say about this. This is unbelievable. I don't even know what to say about this. Here, I, how about that one? Oh my nine. gosh, the Joe Jackson play ball. That's wow, just this. a sample. I, I, I'm, I, I am, I'm speechless. I'm truly speechless. This is, this is, this is wow. Okay, I got to make some sense of this for the audience because this is, this is insanity. This is absolutely insanity. All right, so we're gonna go by, we're gonna go by age here, and I got to pull out, and even, I mean, even in this pile, which you haven't even pulled out, there's like Walter Johnson and the Ty Cobb Greenbacks. So just put them all on. I mean, you got it. Just. It just goes on and on. I think it looks better if your audience sees them. Here. All right, let's 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 do it. Let's bring them all. Yeah, let's spread them all out here. Fun. What the hell? Let's. Oh my gosh. <laughs> We're gonna make. We want people this, to watch the show. This is this is this is the type of thing that that gets ratings. People, are, people are. You're you're a you're a uh, you're a masterful marketer here. Wow. Yeah. This is. Um, now they get it. Yep. This is wild. Fun? This is wild. 
Okay, I gotta make. I, <laughs> be careful with these slabs now. Be I'm careful okay. with these slabs. I've done this before, but not with you. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna make some sense of this because there's some. This unbelievable. So, first of all, this one jumps out at me, right? The 1933 Gaudi Lou Gehrig. And I know you've got an incredible Lou Gehrig bat. We're gonna have to see that in a moment. But this is such a beautiful copy of the card, PSA 8. Actually, look at, you've actually got another. Another PSA 8 here. You got multiple PSA 8s here. This is this is insane. Look at this. And then and then I see the Now Jeff, I have to ask you. In your lifetime have you ever had a collection this this no. seen like this? No. So this is a no. new experience for an old fart like you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've never I've never seen a collection like this before in my life. Never. This is unbelievable what I'm looking at right now. This is wild. I've, I've, th so the Babe Ruth Gaudis has been something that I've been collecting in a lot lower of a grade than these. But these are, I mean, just beautiful PSA 8 copies. Is the other one around? Yeah, there's a fourth one. There's the, the yellow uh, version of it. It's, well, let's see. We got is, that, is that in there too? Oh, yeah. Somewhere in here. Oh, here it is. I found it. It's over oh, yeah. here. Yeah, put them all it's, together. It's hiding underneath the 1915 Cracker Jack set. So, you know, it's... it's uh, Look at, I mean, look at that. Gosh. This will make the cut. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's absolutely incredible. I mean, God, the, the, the quality of the images on this, that the green one is so unbelievably sharp. So unbelievably sharp. It looks, it literally looks like it, it was, was printed yesterday. It's so unbelievable. 34 Gaudi, the Lou Gehrig. That's a very famous card. Both, uh, both that you know, kind of green background copy and the yellow background copy right there. Those are absolutely incredible ones. I got someone's got to hand me my phone. I got to, I got to hand me my phone there, <laughs> Charles. I got to take a, take a. This is, this is one for the history books right here. So Jeff, I've known you for a couple hours, and <laughs> I feel like you're my brother. Uh, and that I do, I've been watching your hands to make sure that you don't find your pockets. So with that said, if you laid out all the modern cards that people own, yeah. and you could put them on a table, and you had a choice of taking this with you yeah. home, or all the modern cards, basketball, football, and everything, why don't you tell the audience why you picked whatever you decide to pick? I would choose this. I would choose this, and I would choose this for a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, your collection in particular here is obviously a absolute one of a kind. All of these cards are in such high grade, such top condition that it it would be it would be impossible to build this scope of collection again. Um, but in addition to that, what you've built here is so much history, right? So we're looking here. We're looking here not just at baseball players, but we're looking at truly a piece of American history, and we're looking truly at a piece of the history of sports cards in general. Because when you go back to cards like the Ty Cobb T206, and, and to look at this card, you know, the red back in a in a in a PSA 8 is absolutely amazing. And then you've got the Cracker Jack cards, you've got the shoeless Joe Jackson. Cracker Jack cards and many of the Cracker Jack cards from 1915. You've got the 33 Gaudi set. You've got Babe Ruth from 33 Gaudi. You've got Lou Gehrig multiples from 33 Gaudi. I mean, it, it's this is sports card history. This is baseball history. This is American history. It would be impossible to beat this. All right, Marshall. So you have absolutely won me over with the scope of your card collection but you've got a lot more than just cards including type one photos tell me tell me about this mickey mantle type one photo what makes this one so special well sometimes words don't describe what makes it special oh look at that that's incredible so is that the original photo for the cover of for the, the cover of the book the biography of mickey mantle wow what a good photo too Pardon? Such a good photo of Mantle. This is 1954. Okay. And what floor. makes the Type 1 photos special? For those out there, I know you're an expert 
on photos. For those out there who don't understand the significance of what a type one photo is, talk to me about that. Well, 2005, Henry Yi and I wrote the book on photographs and we invented the number type one de description two, three, and four. And that is now used all over the world. Including by PSA uh, when they're grading. Well, that was, uh, they, when Joe Orlando was with Collectors Universe, we visited with him and he loved the idea of encapsulating photographs. And we decided not to grade photographs. Okay. Uh, it's impossible. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's just too many uh, factors to put into it. And, and so we did it by types. I do want to make it clear to the, to the people watching the program, don't get worried about you don't have a type one. Type two, three, and fours are really special. You have to remember new service photos, black and white photography ended uh, in the 60s. You know, we had glass plates, we made photographs out of albumin and, you know, and daguerreotypes and so on were made. But you have to understand, those of you that see a beautiful image that's a type two, three, and four, own it. It's less money. The story is there. The image is just as important. If it's missing a corner or has a crease or it's got some journalistic marks on it, don't worry about it. Why spend $10,000 when you can spend $250? Go for it. You have to understand this is not, this is still a hobby. It's not about money. It's not about winning. It's about enjoyment. I just happen to be there at the time of the Civil War and was there before <laughs> anybody ever discovered America. And so this, listen, so you're I, able to buy all of this for I mean, I'm paying, a fraction of what it's worth today. I'm paying $1,500 for a Clementi rookie and a nine. I'm paying $3 for commons. I mean, you know, so this is, I didn't have a lot of money. Uh, you know, I mean, I was better off than most, but I mean, when I bought, uh, some of these cards, they were $2,500, $750. Gowdy, Gowdy, uh, Gowdy uh, uh, Hall of Famers were 700 bucks in, in eights and nines. So this is, I remember uh, all these mantle cards were, I don't know, $300, $150. So we wrote this book, and Henry E. Uh, is really does most of it for PSA. I quit doing a lot of the grading, though I do participate because I don't have the time. But what I'm trying to explain to, the, to your viewers is once you, we did this book, and once you do, we'll, we'll talk about it later, bat, book on bats, and I wrote this with two other guys, and the bat book's been updated. People have confidence in the product. So this, these books written by people like myself that have experience help make the market, mm -hmm. help the public understand what is valuable. I'm not talking about money now, I'm talking about the value of the experience of owning a Cobb or owning a photograph of, of uh, Babe Ruth or Greg Maddox or Mike Schmidt or D Derek Jeter or Willie Mays. So, uh, that's the value. So if you want to hand me another photo, let's do some really fun ones. Why I recognize you... this photo. Okay, you talk about it. This photo is the photo from the other most iconic baseball card of all time. You've got the 52 mantle, obviously, the 52 tops mantle, considered one of the most iconic baseball cards of all time. And then, of course, the T206 Hannes Wagner is the other most iconic baseball card of all time. And this is the photo from it. I've never seen this before. I've never seen it before. I'll, you know, obviously I've seen the card image a, a ton of times, but I've never seen the photo. Well, if you continue to be nice to me, you can come back and look at it again. <laughs> uh, so what I want to say about this, you see, let's talk about when the photo was made. So okay. turn it around okay. and look at the back and show the Coca-Cola ad. Okay. That Coca-Cola ad is 1904. Interesting. The card of... Wagner yeah. is 1909. Right, 1909. So the image is five years earlier. Interesting. A lot of people don't so know it, that. So the photo was taken for this Coca-Cola ad? Or is it just used for, it was taken in general and used no, for that I, purpose I, and other purposes? I, you know, I think Carl Horner, uh -huh. and, I, and who's 
considered by uh, um, the most Smithsonian photographer. Uh, her last name is Einstein, and she is related. Albert Einstein was here. She's a top gallery photographer. She said, you can't even duplicate the quality of taking this photos. You know, they had those big cameras, mm -hmm. glass plates. So if you look at the photo, and this is what I'm trying to tell, look at the image of the photo. Yeah. Look at the story of the photo. Horner never signed the back of his photos. He only had, you have to have the mount to make it a type one. Where Bang, Conlon, Brace, Paul Thompson, all the great photographers that are recognized for the first time in this book, A Portrait of Baseball Photography, are now... People want to collect the Thompson and the Conlon, but if you don't have the mount, and you got to be careful when you collect mounts because a lot of people will have a mount and then they'll put a fake Wagner on the mount. So that's why we, you and Jeff, you and I mm -hmm. have talked. Get, learn, get a mentor, mm -hmm. talk to people that know what they're doing because there's a lot of this stuff going on that are described as type ones and they're not. Yeah. So, uh, when we talk about photographs, yep. it's even more technical than the cards. Yeah. So, um, and if I, I think I wouldn't buy a Type 1 unless there's a letter from Henry Yee or me or both right. of us. Because right. uh, it's too complicated. Interesting. Wow, that's wild. Talk to me about, talk to me about this photo. Is this a Type 1? Yes. That's the Garrick 33 Gaudi Type 1. Oh my gosh, it is. It is. Look at that. Look at that. That's it. That's it. That's the Gehrig. Unbelievable. That's really, really cool. And then how about this one? That's a real signature. Wow. Now, this was used when Honest Wagner ran for sheriff and lost. Interesting. Yeah. They, that, that was on his, on his, I have a pin that looks like this, but this was the image he used when he ran for sheriff. You know, Walter Johnson ran for office, ran for Congress and lost as well. Huh. So, uh, compliments of Hannes Wagner, he signed it. It's, look at the beautiful signature. Yeah, it's a really nice signature. Now, if you that's, look at That's this, penmanship that you don't see uh, with modern day athletes today. They're not, they're not taking the time to sign their you know, modern cards with quite that much uh, penmanship. Exactly. So that's just an example of some of the wonderful quality of photographs that are out there. But there are images like this that you can spend a hundred bucks and have, put it in your office, put it in your caveman. Enjoy it. Don't worry about the money when you collect. Worry about what you enjoy. Yeah. And I can't emphasize that enough. I got lucky because it was, nobody cared when I collected this right. stuff. And I was able to collect before anybody cared about it. I collected bats before anybody cared about it. I always was, I collected ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. Nobody cared about photos. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, now that we wrote the book and people knew what they could trust. Mm -hmm. Trust is everything in this business. Yeah. Okay? Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I know you've got an incredible bat collection. My bat collection is probably, without question, uh, I have more Hall of Fame game use bats than anybody, including the Hall of Fame. <laughs> and, you uh, have, how many do you have? 286. 286 Hall of Fame game use bats, more than the actual Baseball Hall of Fame itself. Well, I don't know if they have more bats, but I'm talking about Hall of Fame or game use game bats. Game use, yeah. Um, and so, again, it's being ahead of the curve. So this is the Holy Bible of collecting baseball bats. Uh -huh. And uh, Vince Malta, a dear friend of mine, who wrote the book, uh, came to my uh, venue and uh, because I, we were able to use all the bats to figure out how you can tell when they were made, okay. if they're really used by the player. There's what's called index bats which means that a player can order a mantle bat because he liked the shape and the weight, uh -huh. but never, mantle never used the bat. Gotcha. So I, have, I collect mainly uh, Louisville Slugger bats. Uh, there are players that use Adirondacks. Willie Mays used Adirondacks as well. So, but uh, when it comes to Spalding, uh, I 
take the position, this is my opinion, you cannot prove a Spalding bat is held, held by a player and it's game used. Why? Uh, though some will disagree with me, but I'm happy to have a live debate about it, is that when you look at the uh, all the bat books, you know, when they sold equipment back in the day, some, uh, the equipment books, uh, Spalding uh, uh, made bats for stores. And if you consider they didn't have FedEx and U UPS, and they didn't, in they didn't have bats where, you know, you could order them. They went to the store and bought the bat, the Spalding bats. Uh, when it comes to Adirondack, you have to be careful with those because some players used them. And, the, and, and even though they had a contract with Adirondack, or you had a contract with Louisville Slugger, uh, you know, during the World Series, Adirondack would give each player two bats. Mantle would have Louisville Slugger and Adirondacks. But, you know, that didn't mean they used them. So when you see at Mickey Mantle, Adirondack, 1956 World Series, there's a chance he never used it. The other thing, uh, so let's, let, I'm just telling you, uh, that doesn't mean that players didn't use Spalding, they didn't use, they, or Bat Wright or Zen Beck, uh, and now we have so many bat companies, I don't even know the names of them anymore. But it's uh, clearer now, you know, with people authenticating player bats at the stadium, putting them in their hands, which is a good thing too. Um, you know, there's Worth, Mizuno, and, and, and uh, uh, at maple bats and so on. Uh, so it gets confusing, but uh, now people are saying, well, he hit a home run with that bat. You know what? If you want to spend $20,000 because some player hit a home run in game four of a World Series that nobody's ever going to remember in 30 years, you got to remember, don't live for the moment, live for the time. And if you don't, you don't get emotional just because some player you'll never hear of again uh, hit a home run in one game four of a 2015 World Series and you pay 10 grand for it. Pretty, pretty, you know, that's ridiculous. Uh, you know, just be, collect, you don't want a player's bat, get a nice game use bat. Don't worry about it. It's an event bat and, and you'll be just fine. So here's this mantle bat. Now, how do you read these bats? I'm just going to be very brief. Power eyes is only used starting in 1931. So let's try to date this bat a little bit. So you see, Made in USA was put on Louisville Sluggers probably late 1920, 1921. Hillwork and, and Bradsby. Bradsby didn't become a partner, as we look at the center brand, until 1914. Nobody really knows what 125 means. We have checked with the Forest Service, the Adirondack Mountain people. I, I've, I've gone to Louisville Slugger. I'm not the only one, but we know that it was put on the bat around 1913. So basically, when you look at the, the shape of genuine and all the lettering here, I can tell this bat is, uh, I can date it in the 1960s. How do I date it 1961, the year Maris and Mantle were chasing Groose record? Right here. P72. Okay. What does that mean? Mantle liked the P72 bat. The, and when you look at the records in this book, mm -hmm. and someday if we do this again, I'll tell you my experience with Louisville Slugger and, and the records and how they kept them. You would be amazed. The vault room at Louisville Slugger, when I went there, was it like a janitor's closet? You know, we think, oh, the vault room. It's like the Gowdy Gum Company. We had a big factory. They made those Canadian Gowdies in a house. Mm -hmm. So you can see the, we, these are the records that we were able to get Louisville Slugger to kindly and graciously let us use. So only Mantle used the P72 bat one year, 1961. Oh, wow. So that, you so know, that, for sure. a special bat. Plus That's a very special bat. Mantle never liked signing bats except for his children. Right. So this is really a special, special wow. bat. That's amazing. And what, what about this one here? 
This looks a little older here. Talk to me about this one. Okay, this is, you can look on the websites and you'll see there's, people are selling Hannes Wagner bats. Some of them don't even have his name on them. Some of them are coaches bats. Some of them are just baloney. This bat is the holy grail. Why? Because it's side written, 1916. The batting label period of this bat is from 1916 to 1921. So if this wasn't side written, I couldn't prove that it was used when he was a player because he became a coach after 1917. So the fact that it's side written, which means Wagner put a label on it, sent it to Louisville Slugger, just like this. They didn't put them in boxes. They just put a lab mailing label on it. And when it got to the factory, they wrote Pittsburgh Pirates, Hannes Wagner, with the date and the year 1916. Hmm. So if you look at this bat, again, the center brand is like the Rosetta Stone and the barrel brand. The fact that he signed the bat is script. It's not in block letters, meaning he had a contract. Mm -hmm. with Louisville Slugger. He's the first major player, the first player, I should say, that had a contract with Louisville Slugger. Now notice the nails in the bat. You watch, you can't touch the barrel. See the nails? Yeah. Okay. When the tree rings start to split from the ball hitting the bat, they would use carpet nails. Hmm. So you want to see this on a hmm. bat because that's how they, you know, the player could would might only have one or two bats the whole year. Right. And so they, and it was yeah. an era where you, it wasn't about power, it was about placing the ball. Right. So uh, you're looking at two bats that are part of, again, along with the photograph of Wagner and along with the, of the cards, the mantle card, we have more than one Holy Grail. We do. So let's go to the next We bat. do. We do. Now I'm looking at a third bat that I suspect is... Ty Cobb. <sighs> now, let's, now, if we hold up this uh -huh. and we hold up th this, uh -huh. they have to be pristine. Sure. You don't want that. Not the bat. case with bats. You want them to be used. You want them to, you want be them to look beat up, right? Yeah. So... You got to be think. Now we got to think. Of, our brain has to think differently. Let's see how messed up the bat is because that's what you want. So let's look at Cobb's bat. Again, it has the appropriate markings, and we don't have time to do to learn about the, all the markings. But what's special? See how he put the nails in the bat because mm -hmm. it's checking. Yep. Look at now. See the spike marks. Yeah. And we know Cobb is big on spikes. Mm -hmm. And then it's side written, 1925. Yeah. So if you want the perfect girl, it's in this bat. <laughs> so you now see Wagner, uh -huh. Mantle, and Cobb. Yeah. This is, these are the top of the game. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm trying to tell people is, look, there are a lot of players out there, Arenado and Jeff Greg Maddox and... You know, pitcher bats are very difficult. Like Jim Cott just got in the Hall of Fame. I was able to find one of his bats. Uh, Randy Johnson, mm -hmm. Sandy Colfax, uh, Don Sutton. Uh, so uh, I like pitcher bats a lot, uh, but I also like, you know, player bats. My advice to people collecting bats, you don't have to play the game and get, you know, it's like, oh, he hit a home run or... Or this is a game, game three of the World Series. You got to remember, no one's going to remember that stuff. Nobody cares. They don't. They care if you have Babe Ruth's bat. Nobody cares if Joe Bag of Donuts in the Minnesota Twins won the World Series in Game Seven with a home run. Nobody's going to care. So why pay ten thousand dollars because you're living for the moment? Mm -hmm. Live for the time. Mm -hmm. Buy a bat for two hundred and fifty dollars, not seven thousand. Of a player, does anybody care about Harold Baines, Minnie Minoso, and and some of the you know and and uh, high pockets Kelly and you know you got to be careful. Mm -hmm. uh, so, 
that's that's my advice when it comes to uh, these bats. Yeah. Well, same is true with cards, I think, in that respect as well. I yeah. mean, over time, people just remember the all-time greats. You know what the best when you collect is what you think is the best. Yeah. Not what I think is the yeah. best. And if you own some of this stuff and it's a type three or four, or the card of Ruth is a three or five, who cares? Mm -hmm. You own history. You own an image. You show it to your friends. You put it in your office. And that tells you another thing you've got to understand. Do not put autographs out in the light. Cover, keep it in the box in the dark, number one. Number two, autographs signed by a big pen stay longer on a baseball than an expensive pen. Number three, um, do not have any of your collection in fluorescent lights mm -hmm. or in any sunlight whatsoever. Number four, the, the temperature in a room that you have anything of paper products or cards or bats, 67 to 69, 70 degrees constantly. Stay away from humidity. When you buy something, it comes in an a, a box full of acid. Mm -hmm. If you keep your stuff in those boxes, you're going to have a lot of problems. If you don't use mylar, mm -hmm. if you don't use UV lighting, mm -hmm. UV glass, when you get something framed, make sure it's acid-free mm -hmm. on the mounts and the, everything is acid-free. Do not keep gloves next to cards because they have acid in them. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn not only how to collect, but how to take care of your stuff. Yeah. Incredible. Great advice. Appreciate you sharing. You bet. Marshall, gloves, balls, you've got it all. Tell me about these two pieces and why these are so special. I've never seen another game use Sandy Koufax glove. Signed by him. This is... One of the examples of the balls, baseballs that I collect. This is 1963. Sandy Koufax used this ball to win his 20th game of the season, and he wrote on here, win 20, and this is, this is his ball. So, and he, he dated it. How do I know this is Sandy Koufax's glove? Other I'm, than the fact he signed it? I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't tell you, and you'll have to come back. I'm just <laughs> kidding. So, there's, here's how, the story. One, he signed it. Yeah. So what? Yeah. Because he I know can sign any gloves. Players sure. will sign any model right. gloves, all the bats, pictures. The story is as follows. Now, this leads us to letters of provenance, okay. LOAs. A lot of LOAs aren't worth the paper they're written on. So, if I may, this is important to my whole collecting world. Whatever you collect, I don't care what it is, this is the standard you should use. It's called clear and convincing evidence. Means the evidence is highly and substantially more likely to be true than untrue. The trier of fact, you the collector, must have an abiding conviction that the truth of the factual contention is highly probable. That's clear and convincing evidence. Most L any LOAs that use the rule of exclusion is not a science, which means if it's not A, B, or C, it must be true. Don't ever buy anything that says that. Any LOA, and there are tons of them that say, the circumstances suggest that this is game use. So I come to the opinion mm -hmm. this is game use. Not worth the paper it's written on. Anytime you see the word apparent, possibility, appears to be, don't buy it. You got to remember, history is written by people that aren't, weren't there. Right. So these people that, that write these letters, you know, doesn't mean that they're bad people, but they, they're not, you're the expert, not them. And you got to remember, anytime there's a profit motive, there's a problem. Need I say more? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So again, back to the back to the beginning. Be your own sheriff. Mm -hmm. Learn what you're doing. Get a mentor. And fourth, wrapping it up. Don't be stupid. Right. And don't be emotional. Sure. 
this is a business, no matter if you spend $50 or 5000 or yeah. 100000 So the story on this is, this, uh, he's in the World Series, and Colfax smoked cigarettes like everybody did. And he left his lighter in somewhere where an umpire found the lighter. And it was a lighter, Brooklyn Dodgers, or I think it was L.A. or whatever. Uh, uh, it was a Brooklyn Dodger lighter that was given to Colfax. And he forgot and left it. So the next season of spring training, the umpire, who's, who's, I have letters of provenance. I'm very careful because it's not cheap, this glove. He, he sees Colfax in a, in, a, in a bar. And they're having, they're sitting there and, and the guy, the umpire said, here's your lighter you, you left. Actually, he left it in a bar with the umpires that year before. I had the story wrong, but that's what happened. But he says, here's your lighter. Colfax says, God, I really miss that lighter. That meant a lot to me. And he gave him this glove. Hmm. Wow. So, yeah. so the umpire returned his missing lighter. He gives the glove to the umpire as thanks. So guess what you get to do, Jeff? Put it on. Okay. But I don't think you get your whole hand in it. But yeah, not going to touch the autograph. Yep. Yeah, going to respect that. Yeah, it's tight. Well, it's because it's old. Yeah. And it's not been. You got to. You notice the leather is sort of a, a cheap kind of. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. it's not like today where they make. You know, you should see, I have Hank Aaron's glove. You should see, I mean, it, it, you, it's not anything special. Right. See the floating pockets starting to develop in the uh -huh. glove? Uh-huh. So, also, uh, there's a, a fellow that I used on, you know, the gloves have numbers on them. Mm -hmm. So I can date when that glove was made. Okay. Uh, I can tell you now, most letters on gloves... You have to be really careful because there's some real issues. Um, so, in summary, what I what I think we should get out of all this is education, yeah, and enjoyment, and having a lot of fun doing this. As I said from the beginning, um, uh, don't get caught up in the battle of having spending a lot of money doing this. You know, it's still a matter of enjoying taking your kids to a ball game, understanding how important the national pastime is, under, enjoying the story, the images that you collect, and the history of the players, the golden era of baseball, the meaning it has in our national culture. That's what you should enjoy. Don't worry about, I have one-on-one, -on -one, or I've got the best eight or ten. You know, I come from the, a different world where... It was available to me at a lesser price, mm -hmm. but you know, there's no winning of this. You, you, I'm fortunate that, but I'm having fun. Yeah, you can spend less money and have just as much fun. Yeah, thank you, Marshall. This is absolutely incredible, the greatest collection I've ever seen. And I thank you so much for sharing it with us. This has just absolutely been amazing. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you as well, and, and hopefully, we can. Do, these, do more of these episodes because there's a lot more you and I can visit about and have a, enjoy. I enjoy meeting you for the first time as well and wish you the best of luck. I appreciate it. We will do more of these for sure. I know the audience will absolutely love it. Thank you very much, Marshall. Take care. Take care.